Mikey Judd Zolgad and our friend Courtney Cronin from ESPN.com. She covers the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, you have posted, Courtney, a 53-man roster projection on ESPN.com. The Vikings have to cut their roster to 53 by 3 p.m. Central Time on Saturday. And so we're just going to give you the floor here. I mean... What do you think in your mind? Let's let's start with this question. Who do you think? What what does the bubble look like right now? And do you foresee any shocking surprises on Saturday at three? Honestly, nothing too shocking. Um, you know, they they survived the scare with Riley Reef uh, this week when they were able to get Yannick and Gakwe via the trade, and then they went to Reef and you know, kind of forced his hand into the restructure. So they're able to keep the offensive line intact for now. Like I wouldn't honestly rule out maybe a potential, maybe they, you know, look at their interior and say, Hey, we can probably upgrade this with something else. Maybe they look at a last minute trade for that. Just because I still think that that's the area that is probably a concern because if you really liked Pat Elfline as an offensive lineman, if you, I mean, maybe the fit is better for him at right guard, but I just think that that's something you shouldn't rule out completely. Um, you know, maybe they do a last second Saturday trade or, or something like that, but Outside of that, I mean, there's really no surprise, surprise cuts with any vets. Like if you would have asked me this before training camp would have started, I don't, I don't know if I had, I would have to go back and look. I don't think I had Shamar Stefan on my roster uh, back in July because, you know, we thought he wasn't going to be playing three technique. Michael Pierce is going to be playing nose, the whole thing. So like, because of some of the things that have happened this off season or like this last month with this team, I don't think you're going to see any like super shocking cuts. I mean, if there is a veteran cut or two, it's probably going to be somebody that's like third on the depth chart at their position. So yeah, I mean, it honestly may not be a very eventful day for the Vikings on Saturday, but you know, the day that I cut down day for me is always, I dread it because you're like sitting in the same place for 12 hours. I will be sitting in this chair, just like figuring out who's gone where, who's getting cut, how they're trickling out, uh, the whole thing. But like the waiver wire day, when people start putting claims in for guys on Sunday, I mean, last year, um, they got Britton Colquitt on Sunday. Um, and I think that that obviously like changed the the out part of the outlook for their special teams in 2019. Um, but you can get some really, you know, those guys who are roster or cap casualties, things like that, because they have to be under the cap by that time as well on um, Saturday that that's a good time to look for instant type upgrades to the roster. So how, how much easier, Courtney, does this exercise become for you and the team by extension? Because there's really shouldn't be, if teams are smart, enough time to get cute. Like, you know, ordinarily you took a long look at a guy and you saw him. Oh, my God, did you see him in the fourth quarter of that fourth preseason game? We can't let Joe Blow go. He's going to be great someday. But there's no time for that now. So, so how, how much do you think that, the exercise that you did is almost just sort of um, simplified by the circumstances. My, my 53 was definitely simplified this year. Like just because, you know, by and large, when we saw two and a half, three weeks of camp, when we were watching full practices every day, you're seeing the team stay about the same, like the same groups going with the ones, the same groups going with the twos. I mean, you might see guys step in here and there because, you know, when Daniel Hunter was out, um, from practice, they had other guys work in at that right at that left defensive end position, and, and you get a good look at guys like um, Eddie Yarbrough, uh, Jalen Holmes. You think, okay, well, maybe they'll keep them around, maybe they'll be on the roster. But you know, outside of that, you're right, there just wasn't a whole ton of time for experimentation this year. I mean, especially when you look at the offensive line, like, were they going to try to work Ever Ezra Cleveland in um, to get him to compete for one of the guard spots? The answer was really was no because yeah he was with the second team at left guard for the majority of camp but after that COVID day where they had the uh, eight positive cases with the players um and Cleveland was one of those uh, false positives excuse me Cleveland was one of those false positives um from that point on they started splitting Dozier and Collins with the first and second team at left guard probably just to see him get better reps with like better quality competition with them um, and, and Cleveland was relegated to the third team. So he never really had a shot really from that point on. So I think that just given the time crunch, camp was a time to get your vets up to speed. And, and you know, this is a year of player development, but that kind of comes like that's kind of like on the back burner. Like it wasn't like, oh, we have to get this guy, this rookie up to speed. He's going to be playing ample snaps. Sure, it's like that in your secondary, but those guys have looked really good and look like they're able to handle it because they have to. If it's not a necessity, you're not going to be spending as much time 
you know, the extra time trying to get those guys up to speed. I have a hot roster take if you guys want it. Mm. I have a I have a hot position group take. Okay. I think the Vikings have the best running back position group in the NFL. So Del- Delvin Cook, obviously, like top three or four if he's healthy. Mm-hmm. Alex Madison, one of the better backups. And maybe even you could maybe even make a case that he's the third best running back in the division. You could make that case. Probably more like probably more like fourth, but fourth, yeah. Um, and then if you ha- if you had to go into a game with Mike Boone and Amir Abdullah as your running backs because of injuries, I don't think you would be too worried. Um, is that too hot of a take? I don't think they have the best running back group in the league. I think they have one of the best backs in the league with with Cook. I mean, by he's ha- he's he's in a, that elite class of like number one running backs. You know, your workhorse type back. We saw what happened last year when Abdullah and Boone had to f- fill in. Um, and I think back to that Green Bay game. And yes, it was a di- different set of circumstances. I know one of uh, Thielen, I don't think was playing in that game. Um, or maybe w- one of the receivers wasn't playing like when they like just got smacked at home on that Monday night game before Christmas against Green Bay. Well, well Cook wasn't playing that game and Madison just didn't look very good. Um, I don't know if you can infer like, oh, without Dalvin Cook, the offense looks like this normally. I mean, I just think it was a different set of circumstances, but they have a nice one-two punch. And, you know, what you expect from Alexander Madison is that since he played so many, he had so many first team reps in camp, because that's just how they manage the workload for both backs, that he should be playing, he should have a much bigger role this year than he did last year. And he did pretty darn good as a rookie too. I mean, they got glimpses of what would be their option if they indeed do not get Dalvin Cook on a contract extension, they don't franchise and they move on. Alexander Madison would be then going into year three and he would be your lead back. And I think they'd be okay with that. So I'm going to a uh, used car lot, Courtney Cronin, to buy a car and you are going to sell me a used car. Okay. But instead of it being a used car, it's the Vikings guards. Why should I? Why should I be buying the Vikings 2020 starting tandem or a duo at guard uh, for the okay. September 13th? Before order? Courtney answers that, should we all just go around and say like which type of used car, make and model, and year each guard is on the route? Like Elfline. <laughs> like what is Elfline? He's got a lot of miles. A year old Saturn. Your your like 2003 beat up. I don't think he's Saturn. as reliable as that car truly turned Does out. Does he have to 150 be. old CDs sitting on the floor of the passengers? See, there, there's been a lot. <laughs> let's just say this. There's been a lot of break work done there. OK, <laughs> and it might be past the point of no return. But nonetheless, Miss Cronin is going to sell me this car. You know, I I try to think about these guards and I think about the stability of the offensive line, because, you know, when the whole reef thing was coming to a head and even Kirk Cousins said yesterday that that was kind of like a you know scary 24 hours. They didn't know if he was going to stay there. Um any longer. And, you know, obviously he did, but, you know, this is the first year that I can remember in camp where they haven't been moving guys around, having musical chairs, you know, and obviously there were preseason games for them to work through where they were able to try guys out at different spots and try different combinations and try different starters. They didn't have any of that this year, so they couldn't get cute with it. They couldn't get, you know, the opportunity to test drive uh, different used cars at different guard spots. So wow. once they got the lineup set, it was kind of set. So it's like, this might not be looking at this big picture wise, since they got to keep the stability with reef staying, this might not be the team's Achilles heel this year, but we say that. And we also said that in 2018 when, you know, they had all those injuries in camp, Elfline wasn't back yet. And he said, okay, it's set. This it's they're stable for now. Well, they weren't. So it's like, before, I don't know if I can judge Judd how, um, how good this offensive line or how bad this offensive line is going to be this year. Uh, Cause we haven't seen him play. Cause yeah, they look fine in camp right now, but the defensive line is also in a different spot. Daniel Hunter hasn't been practicing. Yannick Ngakwe isn't here yet. Michael Pierce hasn't been here. I mean, they're not like winning these insane battles in the trenches. Like, and the offense has kind of looked a little shaky at points. Um, you know, in some of the situational stuff and the stuff that we see at the end of practice. But, you know, that said, you'd like to think that moving Pat Alfline to right guard where he started 25 games in college is where he'll thrive. You'd like to think that Dakota Dozier would be your left guard, given he has more starts there and more experience. And he filled in really well for Josh Klein last year at right guard. Um, and, and it just did kind of feel like at the end of training camp, he was running away with that job. You'd like to think that all of those things will add up to a better offensive line 
this year instead of, you know, a unit that's ranked 22nd collectively uh, over the last three years in, in pass block win rate, which, you know, it, that's very low. So, well, I mean, pass, pass block win rate football. <laughs> um, you know, we say this every year about the offensive line, though. It, it's been this team's weak link and they've tried to get it right this year. They were obviously hit with COVID. So it's not like their second round rookie. Um, it's going to be in a spot where he's going to be able to contribute anytime soon, but I wouldn't rule that out that like, maybe it, he goes the Brian O'Neill route and he gets thrown into action six, seven, eight weeks into the season. I would not rule that out at all. Uh, okay. Let's, let's move to the wide receiver group here for a second. Mm -hmm. So you've, you have in your projection, the Vikings keeping five wide receivers on the 53 yeah. Adam Thielen, BC Johnson, Justin Jefferson. Some teams like to keep six. Some of it just depends mm -hmm. on like your special yeah. team needs. Um, and then you have, so you have Alexander Hollins and KJ Osborne rounding yeah. it out. And, uh, and you did write that Chad Beebe has one year of practice squad eligibility remaining. And then Tajay Sharp would be, would be uh, sort of last man out and cut there. So your thoughts on the, the receivers. Okay. So the way I started this is like, I was listening to my gut telling me, okay, Hollins has been playing really, really well. He served, you know, about two a week and a half ago, I could tell he was going to supplant um, Tasha Sharp on the depth chart. I mean, he was, you know, when, when players are talking about him kind of unprompted, Kirk Cousins was giving him, you know, some nice props early on in training camp and nobody brought up the name Alexander Hollins you listen and then you're watching how guys are run, rotating in and out of the depth chart, just of like, who's taking what reps where. So that for me was like, okay, keep an eye on Alexander Hollins. He's probably going to at least beat out Tajay Sharp for that last roster spot for like the fifth receiver. Then beyond that, you know, it goes down to the next, the next argument is Hollins versus Chad Beebe. So bb has been given, a, they've invested a lot of time into him because of the injuries and they've kept him around and they like him. It's just like he had issues staying healthy. Um, who do you have the better chance of sneaking through waivers to get onto your practice squad? A Chad Beebe who's had all these injuries or an Alexander Hollins who's this undrafted free agent, raw prospect who, you know, has stuck around with his team. They like him here. They envision things with him here. Um, I think that just to be safe, you put Hollins on the 53 roster and try to get BB onto the practice squad um that way so that's why i put b abc's he's going into his third year and you can only be on the practice squad for three years i think it's six games counts as a full season on the practice squad but you got to remember he was on ir too last year because of the uh, ankle injury so with that said um that's why holland's got the number five receiver spot for me <clears throat> but before that my thing looked differently. I didn't have KJ Osborne as of a week ago. I didn't have him on the 53. I had him on, on the practice squad, but then we see the pseudo scrimmage that they did inside of us bank stadium. And he's taking all the reps at punt return and at kickoff return. Like they drafted him kind of like that Marcus Sherrill's role. Like if you're playing Marcus Sherrill's as a cornerback, you know that you're in trouble. I E what happened against the Patriots two years ago when everyone got hurt. Um, KJ Osborne is the guy that it's going to be a returner. He's not going to be somebody that you probably use all that much as a receiver. Um, so you've got to find a way for him to get on this roster. So for me, he takes over that punt return role that BB was competing for um, and gets his way onto the roster. I mean, it's also optics too. You don't want to cut a fifth round draft pick, especially yeah. like when, you know, it, you, you just don't want to do that. So that's how I came to terms with at least like doing my bottom two of the five. So I I think the balance teams are constantly trying to figure out with wide receivers is so you let's let's take Alexander Hollins as as exhibit A and then Tajay Sharp as exhibit B. So Tajay Sharp mm -hmm. has been in the NFL for three years, and you know that like he has caught passes in the NFL and he's twenty he's twenty six years old and he's just like he's you know that you you got a guy who can at least be a professional and catch passing in the NFL. But you also know that he's not really going to be one of your top two or three receivers. And if you have yeah. to use him for like 800 snaps, you're probably screwed. And so you're constantly trying to evaluate, all right, do we keep a guy that like, we know that Bobby Wade can catch passes and he's probably a bad example 10 years ago because he could also return punts. But, or do you take a flyer on an inexperienced guy and a lot like BC Johnson doesn't wind up as the Vikings number two wide receiver unless he gets a shot. Yeah. Adam Thielen doesn't wind up as a star unless he gets a shot. And I'm not saying Alexander Hollins is going to wind up being Adam Thielen by any means, but you're constantly trying to evaluate, do we give a guy a shot from an FCS school over a guy that's just like kind of a guy in Tajay mm -hmm. Sharp? And, and the Vikings have more often than not 
said yes to that equation. If it's between a guy that's kind of our fourth receiver, he's been around and he's reliable, or a guy that hasn't caught anything, but we want to give him a chance. The Vikings tend to lean toward giving guys chances at that position. Yeah, and I think also, too, you look back to like that, you know, he was active in that Saints game. I think he actually played a little bit, too. Hollins, that is. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a playoff game. Like, Yeah, he cut, I think, cut a couple passes, yeah. it was There was something, too. I think he didn't have his gloves, like his gloves weren't completely tied or his chin. Something happened. I remember there was like a deep ball that was like either bobbled or it was like, you know, he dropped it in the side of Superdome, which he will obviously never do again because you learn your lesson uh, that way. But no, I agree with you. I think that there's, they see something in guys like that where you risk exposing him to waivers and you risk him not being able to come back. Um, And I think that that's a concern among this personnel department right now is all the undrafted free agents that they have. They don't want to expose those guys to other teams. And I know that with the practice squad, you're going to have kind of a stipulation this year. I think you get four guys each week that you want to protect, but you know, to sneak it, this is like a nerve wracking experience on that Saturday going into Sunday to sneak those guys onto your practice squad and like hope that they don't get claimed. That's tough. And so, you know, with a guy like Hollins, I feel like, yes, he's slight and he's, you know, he's smaller build receiver, but he's quick and he's looked really good in camp this year. So I think, Yes, teams haven't gotten to see what he could do in the preseason. That would certainly almost like for sure make him a lock, I think, if he had a really good preseason um, and, and very preseason tape to go off of. But at this point, you're still thinking if you're 31 other teams, well, this is a raw prospect who, you know, they clearly kept around for a reason. So you're insinuating, okay, there's probably a good reason that would happen. Um, so, yeah, I think that he's in a really good spot right now to make the 53 and also actually play this year. Not a ton. Maybe he's, maybe he's catching like 20 sure. passes a year, but that's pretty good. What does the acquisition, Courtney Cronin, of Unique Ngakwe mean for the 2020 Vikings? And how much better do you think this roster is um, right now than it was a week ago when they had a uh, a different plan it looked like at defensive yeah. end? Um, I, I mean, it's a move for now and it's a move for the future. Like it's a move for right now that makes your defense elite again. And that's not to say they weren't elite before, but there were still so many question marks of is Daniel going to play. And from what I've been told, it was a precautionary reason he's sitting out. He shouldn't miss much time, but like even still all that attention is going to be on that side of the line. And it's like, can your pass rush be as good as it was? This team typically likes to have it balanced where you had a Brian Robeson and Everson Griffin. Then you had a Daniel Hunter and an Everson Griffin. And when they couldn't get Griffin back, that's why their attention went to, we need to get another pass rusher because we want to keep a balanced thing. That helps you what you're doing on the back end because the pressure you're putting on the quarterback and forcing him to stay high in the pocket, like that's going to help your pass defense. It really is. And when you have young corners, you might as well. So it's kind of, it all works in conjunction with each other. And I think that, um, you know, He's he's here on the uh, it's a negotiated down tag. He essentially circumvented the the, the tag by taking twelve million um, from the Vikings, which is a six million dollar pay cut. By the time he you know it would have all been said and done, so he clearly thinks that like he's going to get a long term extension here. And from my understanding, the Vikings didn't just bring him here for one year. I mean, yeah, they could franchise him again next year. Um, but they have the intention of working out a long-term deal with him. I think that's the only reason that you make that type of risk on yourself of leaving six million on the table to stay in Jacksonville uh, to, you know, to bet on yourself essentially. So I think it makes their defense good now and in the future. Like yeah. this should be a top ten in defensive efficiency, defensive unit in defensive efficiency again this year and next year it should be top five. It's kind of amazing the, like, the difference one player can make or the idea Mm -hmm. of one player in the way that we talk about this defense, because a week ago it was, boy, the defensive line is not going to put enough pressure on quarterbacks. They're going to expose these young cornerbacks and the whole, like the whole thing is going to be, you know, the, the the links in the chain are not going to be connected. And now it's like, Oh, the Vikings have two of the best pass rushers up front and they're going to give quarterbacks uh, a run for their life. And then those young cornerbacks are going to have to protect for less time so it really, I mean, defense and, and Mike Zimmer has proven this by putting so much effort and attention into the front four and getting yep. pressure on quarterbacks. But like, if you don't have pressure on quarterbacks, those cornerbacks are screwed. And and I think just like with the flip of a switch, the Vikings have probably gone back into the top 10, like you just said, defensively. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this defense is filled with stars to begin with. Like I know that sometimes we forget to talk about that because it was like it was it felt like such a mass exodus of people with Everson yeah. Griffin and you know 
Trey Waynes and, and Mackenzie Alexander and Xavier Rhodes. And then, um, yeah, Linval. Linval. yeah, I mean, and then it's like, crap, they lose Michael Pierce now too, their biggest free agent acquisition, but you still had Harrison Smith and Anthony Harris. You still had Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks, and you also still had Daniil Hunter. And those guys are going to be relied on even with Ngakwe in the fold to bring along the younger group. But, and that's not, it's no slight on Afadi Odenabo, but honestly, I think him being a situational pass rusher where he goes inside on, on passing downs and on third down um, to, to, you know, he's really good at that. Really, really good at that. Like that's what he's, and I don't know if that would have translated, if it would have been a seamless thing for him to go play 40 to 60 snaps a game at defensive end, but we know how good he is at that. So I think you can insinuate that the interior push that they're going to get this year um, is going to be better than it was last year with Shamar Stefan getting, you know, just that, that was a struggle for him at the three technique position. So I think it's, I think you can infer that the defense is because of how those dominoes fell, it's going to be better. Actually, I do have one last 53-man roster question for you. Uh, how did Austin Cutting look in long snapping? Uh, was, was there any question about his abilities during this abbreviated training camp? Zero. Um, Good. This is Good. actually, I mean, I know it's all fun and games because I love long snappers, but um, this year, the fact that we haven't talked about, like, a kicking competition. The Amen. Fact, yeah. It was Preach. It was so weird because I'm like, what's going on over there? Like, I mean, I wasn't. You know, you're not locked into special teams. Like, it doesn't feel like a training camp if you're not locked into the special teams battle. And I'm not talking about gunners and anything like that and who's going to be your return guys. I mean, that obviously is huge. But well, let's actually rank the year. gunners. Can you, let's rank the gunners right now. No, no, she's talking about guys, special teams guys, the coaches turn on, which, which I think is the because they don't turn on gunners. They turn on kickers. They turn on uh, punters sometimes, punters, right? Punters, she, I.E. Matt Wild actually, last year. You know what? <laughs> This falls into the lack of a, a kicking controversy or a special teams problem at Vikings camp falls into the list of things that I've been putting together now for months called pandemic positives, mm -hmm. like traffic, less traffic because the pandemic sucks, but there's less traffic. That's not bad. Okay. <laughs> pandemic positive. Zim didn't have time to obsess about something he should never obsess about. Yeah. No. And I mean, I think that we took that away from him. Like in March, we knew that there, like when both Bailey and Colquitt got extended at the same time, I think we yes. knew that everything would have been, everything was solid at that point. Um, and it hasn't been an issue. I mean, Britton Colquitt's missed a little time here and there, uh, but we've seen, I mean, it's not like he's been like MIA. So I don't think that'll be an issue at all. But, you know, never say never with this team, but it has kind of been refreshing that you're not covering like a kicking circus. Like we covered last year where there was a long snapping competition and a kicker slash punter. Which was um, ridiculous. It was just, it was just, you know, amazing how those things tend to work themselves out if you don't overthink it. Hey, l last thing on this. Um, did the Vikings play a brilliant or dangerous game of contract chicken this week with Riley reef? I can't decide if it was dangerous uh, or it was absolutely brilliant because he was backed into a corner. A little bit of both. So, like, you know, his agent apparently went around and was trying to get him traded to see if any team will pick up that $10.9 million salary. I think the Vikings called his bluff, being like, look, it's not a good time for veterans at this point, veteran, you know, at any position. But really, like, you know, think about the veterans that are still either just got signed or they're still out there, i.e. Jadavian Clowney. Like, you're not naming your own price. This isn't like, you know, the name your own price tool from Progressive. Like, this is a situation where you got to take look at your market and take, take what you have. Like, um, I think that Reef, I mean, it sounded like it got, like, really emotional and that it was, like, something where, uh, you know, it, it, that it was just, like, this could actually happen. Like the way that Kirk Cousins was talking about it, it led you to believe that there was kind of that little scare of, oh my goodness, we might be sending the offensive line into free fall again, where Riley Reef is gone and you're moving O'Neal over and you're putting Rashad Hill or Oli Udo in at right tackle. And it's like, the, the bottom line is stop screwing with the offensive line. You wonder why it's an issue every single year because you make changes to it and doing it at the 11th hour is idiotic. Amen. Like, Amen. and so, you know, was it a dangerous game of chicken? I feel like the Vikings kind of had more of the upper hand here because Reef for for a while, like think about it, for a while they had been trying to upgrade that that left tackle position. Like not too long ago, they were trying to trade for Trent Williams, and that fell through. And then they went and got Ezra Cleveland at fifty eight. Um, you know, Reef was always kind of the one on the chopping block because 
He's a good left tackle. He's not great, but he's good. And, and good is good enough a lot of times in this league. But he's not they, – they can't pay him. They should, he shouldn't be a top 15 paid offensive tackle, you know, with where he's at right now. Uh, 10.9 is just too much. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be an ass here. But, like, and, and I don't – I never want to come for anybody's money. But 10.9 is too much. And they knew that. And it wasn't just the cap. They knew that. The value of the player, where he's at right now, too much. So that's why he took the pay cut because he had really no other choice because – you know, look at your market. If you, I mean, unless you are confident and you have like in writing that a team's going to come get you and pay you what you think you're going to get, do not risk that. That is just like a, it'd be a silly move. So I think the Vikings, honestly, it felt dangerous. And maybe at some points it actually was, but I don't know if they were actually losing sleep over it. I think that they knew they had him backed into a corner. I think the most amazing part of it was how, like, usually in the Vikings are like this too. Rick Spielman doesn't talk about contracts. And, like, sometimes he'll float. Like, like he'll let you know that they are talking with Dalvin Cook's representatives or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but you literally had you had Riley Reeves sitting on a practice. You had Brian O'Neill taking reps at left tackle. And then you had the offensive line coach, like, speculating with the media saying, well, you know, like, Rashad Hill would come over. Like, they're speculating, well, if he doesn't, if rather Reef is gone and well, he doesn't or not like, and that's just kind of the frustrating thing. It's yeah. like, you know, within 15 minutes of that press conference with uh, Rick Dennison and, and Zim talks this morning within 15 minutes of that being over, we find out he agreed to a restructure. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, hey, we, uh, Mr. Mankato update in just a second here, yeah. but a quick shout out for two things. If you want to read Courtney's full 53 man roster projection, ESPN.com, just click on the Vikings tab. And you can find it there and all of Courtney's work. And also Pod MN is a brand new free to download app in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. PodMN.com where you can read more about it too. But it's a it's a local podcast discovery platform. You can listen to Minnesota podcasts and you can discover new Minnesota uh, sports podcasts, non-sports podcasts, you name it. Uh, but uh, Minnesota has all kinds of podcasts that you may never have discovered if not for PodMN. PodMN.com and free in the Apple and Google Play Store. So, all right, well, Mr. Mankato, and people are wondering, why are you guys still calling it Mr. Mankato? It's been it's been years since they've been to Mankato. Well, we like alliteration, and uh, we're not going to change it. And so we made our picks. Judd and I both said Cam Dantzler, and he picked off every pass in the first like week of practice. <laughs> Courtney, you, you had, I believe you had Kenny Willekies, who was yeah. carted, carted out of the Mr. Mankato competition Sad. with an injury, injured reserve. He's, yeah, he got um, moved to injured reserve. They don't want to lose him. I mean, they really liked him. And yeah, for a while, he was taking second team reps there at left defensive end. So I wouldn't change my pick. You know, I, I was confident he got hurt. No no regrets. No regrets. Kenny Willekies, you did not let me down. I appreciate you. No. Um, he just got unlucky. I, I actually didn't see where he got hurt, uh, but it was in the Friday scrimmage. So, so yeah. Turf monster, turf monster got him. Wow, wow. Yeah. U.S. Bank Stadium turf monster. That sounds, that sounds like a season. book Addy and conspiracy theory. Mm. It happens that. there. It happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So really, like you're you're the eyes and the ears for us, and so we we trust that you're not mm-hmm. going to corrupt this uh, proceeding. But what what would you say? I mean, there are still practices left, but you're you're we're not able to watch anything at this point. So yeah, I think that you're right about Dantzler. I think that he's probably the guy who yeah. has run away with it. Like, I mean, I mean, who who had Drew Samia? Was that Chris Long? Did he pick Samia? I think Declan had Declan, Drew Samia. Declan took okay, Drew well, Samia. Okay, well that one that one. Never. Mm. That blew yeah. up. Yeah. yeah it, it just, it Judd, who did you up. have? Dancer. Dancer. And then Phil, yeah. you had Dancer too? We both mm-hmm. had Dancer. Okay. So yeah. and, well, who did Chris have? Who did Chris have? I don't even remember. He, he, I don't he, remember. Did he have KJ Osborne potentially? Or he maybe might have taken KJ Osborne. I mean, KJ Osborne's getting some run. He's yeah, some run. he's definitely probably like a top two or three finisher, but you know, mine mine just got unlucky, got hurt. Do you know why Dancer wins? Dantzler wins because because I would argue that he became the first player in the history of this league to have an interception put on the team website that came off the number one quarterback. Exactly. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if the Buccaneers today are like, watch this rookie intercept, Tom Brady? Ain't it great? First of all, Brady would go nuts. Sanders high stepping. Brady would go crazy, (laughs) right? Like for Kirk, I I guarantee you. I would put good money down that Kirk went into somebody and said, you did that, huh? You did that. You put an interception that I threw that a rookie picked off. I don't know if Kirk, I don't know if, I think Kirk is Teflon, man. I don't think he cares. Oh, I bet he cares. 
I know I that I, Phelan had some high praise for the young corners, and that was actually really interesting to see because obviously the yeah. people don't realize that ball was a little underthrown. The one, the first one that like made the highlight reel, like it was a little overthrown, underthrown. Courtney. I saw um, Courtney right. And so it's not like Thielen was like, oh, I'm getting shown up. But he had some really high praise for the rookie corners about like how tough it's, you know, their jobs have made, like, you know, the wide receivers of getting open. Everything feels like a contested catch. I'm like, that's a good sign. Like, obviously, if your offense is ahead at this time of year, that's good, too. And I do think that they are just because the defense had so much to work through. But um, that's encouraging to see. And it's just like, yes, it's your own competition. And that was early in camp. And, and Dancer has leveled off just a little bit. He's not like picking off everybody once a day, but good sign. Definitely a good mm -hmm. sign. And, and he's got some well due props from the coaching staff and from Adam Thielen. Hey, one last thing here before we let Courtney jump on Zoom press conferences here. Um, if you're Kirk Cousins, you have to, at some point in a post game press conference, you have to drop, if I die, I die, right? Like you, like that has to either be on a t-shirt or it has to be in like response to, or maybe it's a pregame. Hey, Kirk, you're going up against that bears defense again. It's just really giving you a lot of problems. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on going to soldier field playing in knee high grass against that defense? Well, if I die, I die. Yeah. If Akeem Hicks smushes me like a banana, um, <laughs> I die, I die. Look like that was, um, I know that there's a lot of, out there and it was a very controversial thing. And yes, it was, it was, a podcast that was recorded in July that was released about a month later. Um, we didn't know. I mean, every day we learn something new with the coronavirus and COVID-19 restrictions and things you can and can't do. Um, Kirk spoke for 14 minutes. Not all of it was football, but he called his own emergency press conference, essentially, because he was supposed to talk on Thursday. Um, he wanted to get out ahead of it. I agree. Um, I do think, though, that I mean, he didn't walk back any of his comments. This, the the magnitude of saying, if I die, I die. The only reason I take issue with something like that, because I'm not for cancel culture. I'm not for if you say something, you got to, you know, crucify somebody and, and drag them through the coals on it. Like, Kirk is entitled to his opinion. He's entitled to what he wants to say, what he really believes. But you are also in a franchise quarterback who makes a crap ton of money. You are one of the highest paid players in the National Football League. Your words carry weight. I'm sorry. Like, so of course, if you're, if you're shocked that somebody ran with this, that, that outlets were like reporting what you said, you shouldn't be because your, your words carry weight and you have to have a little accountability with it. Um, the issue I take with it is the, if I die, I die. Um, I said this on national radio last night. Do you think that Carl Anthony Towns' mom, when she was dying of coronavirus, do you think she thought the same thing? Do you yeah. think that the 858,000, and I know there's going to be some COVID truthers, which, you know, miss me with that BS, I would say more, but uh, I don't want to get the FCC in trouble or get us in trouble by the FCC. But it just drives me nuts because people are like, oh, that number's so low. Those are human lives. Do you think that those people went into that thinking, if I die, I die? Kirk is a young 30 year old, a young person in his 30s who is in the pristine athletic condition, who has access to a million resources to keep his body healthy. He's, he's got a leg up on everybody else, um, really and truly. I mean, this virus does not discriminate, but, you know, he has the ability to make sure that he can stay safe. So I've just felt like it was a little ignorant and a little tone deaf to say something like that and just maintain the stance. I mean, yes, he clarified it and he was allegedly referring to his faith and kind of like, you know, meeting your maker when it's your time, it's your time. That's neither here nor there because it just came across really insensitive. Um, yeah. And I think that he had a chance in that podcast that he did um, with Kyle Brandt, the 10 questions podcast to really take like a leadership standpoint with it as like the leader of this team of, yeah, masks are annoying. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that he used the word stupid in there, because yes, it was phrased to him like our mask stupid. And he's like, well, I'm not going to call anybody stupid because I would get in trouble. Think before but there's, you but, talk. Think before but they're you stupid talk is that. basically what he said. Yeah. Think before you talk. Your words carry weight. You are a franchise quarterback. You have been doing this for nine years. There is no excuse anymore of, oh, I just put my foot in my mouth. Not over something this serious. Yeah. I mean, Kirk is a good guy. Like, there's no doubt in my mind about that. He's not like a bad person. Um, sometimes he just says stuff and he gets in his own way and he doesn't mean it that way. But then there's like the, oh, why do people misconstrue that? Why are people picking his words apart? Because it just doesn't come across correctly. Like, you know, he's had media training. He's had, he, he's honest to a fault. And people say it's like, oh, he's aloof sometimes. He's just a quirky guy. 
something like if I die, I die comes across as really selfish, in my opinion. And that's just my opinion on it. I, um, I know I'm a beat writer. I cover this team. But I tend to think that I am more outspoken than a lot of people uh, on things like this because I call out BS when I see it. And I just didn't really appreciate those comments. Um, it came across as ignorant. And I think he had a chance to you know, there are a lot of people who are defending. He can say what he wants about masks, he, you know, and there's a lot of like COVID truthers out there. I'm not saying Kirk is a COVID truther, but sometimes those comments come across like that. And I just felt like he had a chance to unify, you know, where things are. And he's right. He has to be available for all 16 games because this team is screwed if, he, if he's not. And so, you know, the way that I look at it, um, it should be, yeah, these are really tough, but like, you know, say it the first time how you meant to say it. And so you're not clarifying it because it just comes across as I'm walking this back, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm glad that you speak your mind on this. And I think, I think, I, I just think that, you know, there, you got to hold it's accountability. Like people act like, Oh, the media dragged this through, like in bleacher report, put this headline and ESPN put this headline. If I die, I die is a really strong statement. But like in, in yes, I'm all for it. I get so frustrated with people all the time about this, especially, I mean, I'm not going to get political here, but like, you know, you see things about that are happening in society and it's like, read the full article, read what actually happened before you react. Cause you saw a tweet about it. Absolutely applies to Kirk cousins here. Read what he said. Like the, read the transcript of the press co of the uh, podcast. I mean, he said what he said. He also was like, I wear a mask for, you know, not for me, but for other people realize that God, if we could take that same approach, we'd be in a far better place. Like if everybody could do that, but, it's the stuff that kind of was like leading into that. Just, it just makes you cringe a little bit and be like, you're better than that, Kirk. Like, the, thing, that. the thing about Kirk and those comments, Courtney, was they didn't surprise you one bit because they were Kirk. And that's sort of Kirk. And, and that and that's the thing is, and I, I told uh, Phil this on Purple Daily yesterday, that's the thing is he doesn't have that gene of a CEO. Like if a running back had said this, or a defensive back, we'd be like, oh, okay, that's interesting, but I'm not surprised, right? But like you expect your quarterback to be more polished in some ways, and he's just not. And I, and he just and and that extends from politics to this to everything. This is just who he, he is. So in seeing the comments, the one takeaway was I'm not really surprised. Yeah, and I'm actually okay with like if that was raw Kirk, like I'm okay with that. I don't need him to put like a CEO polish on it. No. I'd rather hear I'd rather hear from raw Kirk, and that's fine. And I think we're like where I you know, you can, there's one. It's one thing to read the transcript, another thing to listen to it. Mm -hmm. It felt to me like he was paying lip service to, yeah, I know. Like some people think COVID is a thing. I per, like my interpretation of it was him saying some people think COVID's a thing. I really don't think it's a thing, but like I guess because some people think it's a thing, then I'll wear a mask. And like he's basically meeting like the lowest possible bar. And I, I, I almost feel like everybody needs. Yeah. Everybody needs to have a personal connection to COVID before they start to to actually take it seriously. And I know, like, I, and I'm sure maybe Courtney has more than one connection. Like one of my friends yeah. and a and a and a mutual connection of Courtney and myself at ESPN, uh, Jeff Martindale was literally on a ventilator for 20 days, yeah. and the only guy to get off of a ventilator in that wing of the hospital, like he he should be dead. And so when you have someone in your life that oh okay the wow, that happened to this person. He's still being affected by it five months later. Okay, I am I have a different perspective on it than I would if I had zero connection to it. So. It's like, you know, you're an athlete too in a multi-million dollar facility that is taking every protocol. You're not touching anything that hasn't been sanitized and you're not sanitizing it yourself. You are walking through life um, in a way pampered with other people taking care of you because you are a multi-million dollar asset. So, mm -hmm. you know, to say like, to kind of be flippant about it, just to be completely honest, is um, it rubbed me the wrong way. And I don't, I would assume I'm not the only one, um, you know, for his personal health concerns, that's fine. If you really don't feel like you're going to get sick, if you feel like all that, you know, whatever, that's cool. Like, but it's, you know, you had a chance to unify. You had a chance to kind of be like, come on guys, let's defeat this. Not just guys on your team, but like, you know, I read an article from Nancy Armour from USA Today of just like how it's, you know, it didn't affect him and his personal health, but affect, you know, it's like a public health type nightmare right there. When you have somebody who's that high profile of an athlete being, you know, kind of flipping about the whole thing with masks, how's that going to affect other people who, you know, look up to that as like a voice that they trust and, you know, for whatever reason. And I, I just think that you got to be really careful. And I'm not saying that you need to censor yourself and not say what you feel, but 
you know, in clarifying it yesterday, he went, he, he, he fell back on a few things that he typically falls back on, which one is his faith. Like he was, you know, your faith isn't going to save you if you get COVID. I'm sorry. It is. A, I'm not, I'm not trying to be an asshole here. You can bleep that out. I'm not trying to be that, but you your faith is not going to save you if you get this disease and you get sick. Science is. And that is, that is where I, that's where I fall on it because that that's, a, that's a hot button for me because we've seen a lot of that throughout, um, you know, a lot of that throughout the last few months. And for an athlete to say that, you know, you, you just got to be really careful with that. And, and, you know, the, if I die, I die. Sure. If, if that was said in a different circumstance of, you know, because we've seen Kirk too, he has the big rock thing. Um, he takes a stone out every month and puts it out. And that's kind of like, I mean, it's kind of a morbid thing. Like I know that ESPN, did a, ESPN did an, a story on it. I think we had one of the Monday night games. Um, and uh, it's just kind of, a, that's, that's his faith. That is his Christianity. That's what he believes and all of that. That's fine. Um, but when you're dealing with a global pandemic and something that we have, are still trying to learn about, um, it just came across a little callous and I'm willing to speak my mind on it. I hope others will too and not be afraid of their own shadow on it. But I just feel like you got to hold people accountable, um, especially when you are, you know, you are the, Dalvin Cook hasn't had a contract. You are the face of this team, Kirk Cousins. You are the face yeah. of this team. And, uh, and be a little uh, bit more ca cautious with what words come out of your mouth. Cheap plug for those of you who are uh, listening and, and watching on our YouTube channel. We did have Kyle Brandt on for 20 minutes on yesterday's Purple Daily, who provided his thoughts and context. So if you haven't seen that or listened to that, Purple Daily from Wednesday, uh, a deep dive with, with Kyle Brandt. We also broke down Teen Wolf for a while with Kyle Brandt. So we really ran the full spectrum of emotions. I'm only that Courtney has never seen Teen Wolf. <laughs> have you ever okay. seen Teen Wolf? It's on MTV, right? Well, that's the that's the TV Teen Wolf. Oh, We're Michael J. Fox, the Michael the J. Film. Fox '80s movie Teen Wolf. It's what? before your time. Well, he's like, I wouldn't. Worry, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Point it, break. Start there. <laughs> but I did. I did see the real. I did see Real World Chicago that Kyle was in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then. There you 2001, go. Man, 2001, man. 19 years ago. So, uh, Courtney, we appreciate you coming on, and we love when you speak your mind. And uh, and people can go check out your 53 man roster projection and Vikings coverage at ESPN.com. See you next week, Courtney. Bye, Courtney. And uh, that's a wrap on this episode of Purple Daily. Give us a five-star rating, positive review. We appreciate you clicking the subscribe button on YouTube as well. See you guys next time.